what role is my nervous system playing? Am I going about my day constantly in fight or flight where I'm always reacting as if there's a threat, even if there isn't one possible? And then in those moments, there are very conscious, intentional tools that we can do to begin to regulate our nervous system. Can we heal trauma? Absolutely. I mean, most of us, as far as I've seen um, in myself, my friends, my social circles, all the clients I work with, I think a lot of us are carrying the after effects of trauma from wherever in life it has happened in our minds and in our bodies. Ultimately, though, gratefully, though, we can absolutely heal. I mean, I'm a, the biggest proponent of our body's ability to create change, our ability, neuroplasticity, of our brain to create change, and in particular, of our nervous system. And when I'm talking about trauma, I'm usually hand in hand talking about the effects of a dysregulated nervous system and how that impacts pretty much the entirety of our life. And then, of course, the somatic or body work that we can do to bring ourselves back into regulation. It's interesting that body work could plays a role in healing the mind. Absolutely. And that was a big piece that was left out, um, at least when I was coming through the clinical training system over a decade ago now. It was completely left out of any of my training programs. I mean, I was even thinking earlier, I was talking on a previous podcast, I'm very interested in even the neuroscience. And I probably took one as many neuroscience classes that were you know, available in my program. And as far as the nervous system goes, I'm sure I was taught that we have a, a brain and a spinal cord. Beyond that, the whole body was really kept out of my training. And so what I saw before very long into private practice, having a very successful one with clients that I would start to see week after week, month after month, year after year, I kept seeing the inability for these people, incredibly insightful humans, had awareness of these habits that weren't serving them, even came up with plans of action. I always kind of advertise myself as an action-based therapist. I'm going to give you tools to go out and create change. Yet I was so disempowered because I wasn't helping my clients get better. And if I was really being honest, I didn't feel well myself. I didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel connected to this life. I you know, set my career out to, to achieve and I didn't actually feel fulfilled. So ultimately I understood after I got past the frustration and the worry that I wasn't doing my job that the reason why we weren't getting better it was because we weren't addressing the body hmm. the body plays a pivotal role what's the relationship between psychology and psychiatry so psychiatry um you go through a medical typically a doctor training um, a medical doctor training and it's so minimal the classes you take to then get the psych psychiatrist designation typically you're associated with prescribing medication um, the training i went through being a clinical psychologist and any other type of now licensure where it allows you to provide talk therapy that's very much focused on the mind. And in the clinical psychology field, the gold standard, if you will, is known as cognitive behavioral therapy, which mm. really simply this idea that change your thoughts, change your emotional experience, and change your behavioral reactions. And I'll be the first to shout how powerful our thoughts or our beliefs can be. And in my first book, How to Do the Work, I devote a whole chapter to the power of belief. But that actually, again, without emphasizing the body and the dis this dysregulation that lives in the body isn't going to be enough to create the change that people are seeking. Wow. Where, where does trauma come from? Like, how does it, where does it come from and how does it typically manifest? Yeah. For a very long time, and again, this is taught in the field to me, was that trauma comes from an event, a particular type of event. Um, and we were, you know, given the categories of those instances of abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, extreme neglect, having a parent who's incarcerated. I'm referencing now the ACEs scale, which came out in the 90s, really documented the effects. No matter what time these cataclysmic events happened in life, it documented that you carry the psychological, emotional, even physical effects into adulthood. However, that left out, as far as I'm concerned myself, and a, and a lot of my clients who don't check those boxes, didn't have those moments in time where kind of they were destabilized in life change. So I'm a big proponent of shifting the definition from applying it to event and applying it to the individual's experience of an event. And really simply how I define trauma is an overwhelming event that we are unsupported. Mm. Could it be like a series of events? Series. Oftentimes it's the consistent ways our caregivers and who in childhood were completely dependent on. Yeah. We need someone to show up and meet our physical needs or we don't have a chance at survival similarly with our emotional needs. So many of us didn't have the attuned caregivers who were either not physically present to show up and, and take care of us physically and emotionally and spiritually like we need it, 
Or for me, I had the instance of, I had a mom who stayed at home and was always present, but emotionally she was so ab absent. So if I consider how many stressful events happen in just a typical day developing, the consistency of the stress and the consistency of the lack of support registered in my body as trauma. Wow. Yeah. Because I mean, a lot of people think of trauma as like mm -hmm. uh, some, some acute form of abuse, right? Like yes. whether it's sexual abuse, but like it could be something as covert as not being held, you know, in a moment mm -hmm. of, of distress, right? Yes. As, a, as a child. Yes. And it's, it's shocking because for some of it is generational teachings. Um, I come from two older parents who, when they were parenting, were actually, you know, taught that children or emphasize the physical needs of children. It's not until more recently that we even are aware that children even have emotional needs. And I've even heard schools of parenting that, I don't know, there's an official name for it, I think, but the cry it out method. This idea that when your child is having an upset time or is dysregulated, that the appropriate thing to do around sleep, this comes up as well, is to lock them in a room and to be alone. Wow. So as simplistic as, you know, even maybe listeners hearing you say, oh, being held when you're upset. I mean, when we're upset, our nervous system is reacting to a perceived threat. We don't actually feel safe. And the way our nervous system is wired and we're wired to co-regulate with another human. So if that human's not there, that moment of upset is really big and really overwhelming for us as children. Wow. What about when parents lean on their children mm. too much emotionally? Right. And that happens really, really common for a multitude of reasons. Um, it's usually referred to as parentification, when either children are relied on to actually physically care, possibly for the parent, possibly for siblings, or to care for themselves at too young of a developmental age, meaning feed themselves, put themselves to bed, take themselves to school. And a lot of times it happens in the emotional world where a parent begins to treat a child like a best friend, mm. sharing emotional aspects of their life complicating it even more when what is being shared is possibly about the other parent, whether they're separate or together in a relationship, it really blurs the boundaries and really is too developmentally mature a lot of these topics for children to understand. And of course, and if it's about your other parent whom you love and are connected to, then this can cause a, a lot of difficulty. And I think sometimes parents think they're just well-intentioned, they're close with their children, they're being their buddy, that we really have to understand the developmental age of children. And it's just not appropriate to be sharing some of this emotional content. Yeah, that happened to me. Yep. That happened to me. I mean, I was incredibly close with my mother, person, the, the most important person in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, was always physically there for me. But emotionally as a child, uh, leaned a little too much on me, almost as if, as you said, I was, I was like her best friend. When I wasn't her best friend, I was her child. Right. And would share things about her marriage that were to, you know, in retrospect, I know were totally inappropriate. Yeah. And it's led to, I think, me having difficulty in, in like my, in relationship. Mm -hmm. So I've been, you know, seeing a therapist for the past year, but it's just, uh, it's just interesting how these, like these things that you wouldn't necessarily think to call trauma actually serve as really destabilizing forces in one's life. Yeah. And even if we want to expand this conversation beyond calling it trauma, any the dynamics that we repeat and cr are created in these earliest relationships are typically the dynamics that we're going to continue to repeat in all of our relationships. So whether or not it's blurring of boundaries like you've experienced and are describing, or just learning how to show up in care of, or being you know a, a yes person, someone who doesn't know how to say no, or we squash our feelings. All of this is how we had to exist with these early relational people that we are interacting with. And then that becomes our prototype. When we get to peer age and we go to school, we tend to embody the same roles, operate the same way. If we don't feel safe sharing our feelings at home, we probably aren't going to go into school and readily share our feelings to our peers. So this conversation expands beyond trauma and can really include any interpersonal dynamic. I locate it beginning, at least in those early relationships. Wow. So how do we then like even start to, to, to write the ship? so to yes, speak. Yes. You, I will always cite the first foundational tool of any healing or change journey is becoming conscious. Mm. Because when we're not conscious, when we're on autopilot, when we just kind of go about the habits that typically we go about, because that's quote unquote who we are, we're really disempowering ourselves. So to learn how to be a conscious observer, which means showing up and 
observing what do we do first thing when we get up? How do emotions, you know, how do we relate to our emotions? How do we relate to other people? How do we relate to our internal world? What are the themes that are running through our internal world? Learning how to bear witness because without that, that conscious relationship, that autopilot is going to continue to dictate our choices. And it, it's about showing up in those moments and to create change, the next step becomes making new choices, not allowing those old familiar patterns to be how we continue to go about our day. Yeah, I guess I feel like a lot of people act like NPCs. You know, have you ever heard that that phrase, like it stands for non-player character? They and act, they did they, hear that, NPC, I love that, okay. Yeah, they uh -huh. just, they essentially go about the day acting as if they are automatons. And of course mm -hmm. they're not automatons, right? Mm -hmm. They're human beings, but I feel like people seldom stop to question their autonomic rote behaviors yes. and responses to, you know, various yeah. S stimuli. Yeah. And it's, I think, understandable because for the most part, that's the only way we've known ourselves to be, for some of us, decades, our entire lifetime. And the daily experience of living in that autopilot feels very reactive, right? This thing happens. I typically feel this way. I'm reacting before I can even stop myself. And I'm speaking from my own lived experience of living in that reactive space. And it does begin to feel like we're a victim to the environment because things happen and I don't feel like I have that control, especially if it's dysregulating my nervous system. Because my nervous system is constantly scanning outside of my awareness and activating these stress responses, even if I'm not conscious. And then once I'm in that mode, I more or less become locked and loaded hmm. in that mode. And it really is hard to, to stop that ship, right? I am screaming and yelling or you know icing someone and giving them the silent treatment. And then I'm feeling shameful on the other side. And I'm wondering what is wrong with me? This is compounded by the fact that most of us see these similar habits and patterns in our families. So now this becomes all I've known of myself. I see the similarity in my families. It's really easy then to entertain this idea that it's genetics, that this is just how I am. I live the daily experience of not being able to create change. And before I know it, I do assume this as my identity. Wow. So awareness is like, is the first step. Awareness is the number one. And awareness means learning not only how to be conscious, but not just carving out that one moment of the day where I'm going to sit maybe in a meditation or bring myself a conscious awareness moment. And then I'm just going to go right back out the door into autopilot. It means learning how to live consciously because it's those decisive moments that we need to begin to make new choices. And if we're not a present participant in those moments, because, oh, I, I did my meditation this morning, I'm going to not, I'm not going to set myself up to succeed in changing my habits in the moments where I need them. So how do we do it? I mean, I know your, your new book is a workbook of sorts, but if you can just give us some like some takeaways, like how do we, how do we cultivate greater awareness? Absolutely. So we want to build that consciousness muscle so that we actually teach our brain how to fire from its prefrontal cortex more often than not. Um, which means building more moments throughout the day. And in the new workbook, I take us through, I intentionally divided it into three different sections. We start with body awareness and all of the different physical habits, which include our nervous system and these states of dysregulation. So expanding our consciousness muscle now to drop into our body and determine how am I caring for my body? Am I meeting its nutritional needs? Am I sleeping? Am I moving my muscles? Am I resting my body the way it needs? And what role is my nervous system playing? Am I going about my day constantly in fight or flight where I'm always reacting as if there's a threat, even if there isn't one possible? And then in those moments, there are very conscious, intentional tools that we can do to begin to regulate our nervous system through grounding, turning our attention to the current moment, turning our attention to maybe how it feels if I'm standing, if I'm sitting with my heels on the ground, what does it feel to be grounded and present right now? Maybe expanding that awareness to my senses, can I actually locate myself here in time, smelling the aromas in the room, touching this hard table beneath me, learning how to be present? Using my breath can be an incredibly helpful one. The breath is one of the first things to change when we get dysregulated. If we're in fight or flight, it'll quicken. If we're in complete shutdown, it'll barely be like we're breathing or we're holding our breath. Teaching our body how to breathe deeply from the belly will help us regulate. So there's many different things that we can now employ in those moments to create that balance. Wow. Super, super helpful. And is this something that that becomes like a practice every day? The hope is, I mean, consistency is how we create habits. This isn't, and especially when I'm talking about nervous system regulation, I know a lot of people hear these tools. Oh, deep belly breathing. I'm going to do that next time I'm in an argument. 
unfortunately, a couple things will happen when you're in that argument next time. The first thing that's going to happen is this logical space in your mind that's going to plan for this new action, which is belly breathing, goes completely offline. Your emotional brain is firing up. You actually simply can't remember or locate that remember that memory to, re to actually execute that new plan. And then on top of it, your nervous system is probably so dysregulated by that point that a couple deep belly breaths aren't really going to help you. It's mm. how do I begin to build that as my daily habit? So for me, because I was in a state of shutdown, um, having been overwhelmed for so long in my early environments, not having the opportunity to fight or flee the threat at hand because I was young, I was dependent, I overwhelmed my system, I was in that state of shutdown. So for me, I set a daily commitment of doing activating breathing to help stimulate my body, to help wake up my nervous system. Activated breathing. So what, is that, what does that actually look like? I was a big fan. I love Wim Hof. Yeah, um, he has awesome. a really great, um, really easy practical because one of the things that we also have to address when we're creating change of any sort is how our human brain doesn't actually want us to change. Mm. No matter how logically good for us these new habits are, the second we go to do something new, it's going to signal a lack of familiarity to our subconscious mind. And our subconscious mind is concerned solely with survival. So the predictable, even if it's a, if it's a terrible consequence, it's happened so many times, I get to predict it comes next. Mm. The second I make a new choice, now I'm walking into the uncertainty of what that outcome will be. So a lot of us really understandably, especially when we're suffering, when we're not feeling well, when we're at that rock bottom and we know life has to change, it's really easy to overwhelm that resistance or that subconscious mind by setting a to-do list, new tasks, change my life from top to bottom starting tomorrow. And because consistency is so important, we can maybe white knuckle these five new things for a couple of days, but chances are by day five, six, seven, that resistance is going to be so strong that we're right back into those old habits. So I'm a big proponent of setting what I call small daily promises, keeping that promise so small and keeping with one promise, like habit stacking model for a consistent amount of time until we do that thing more often than we don't. And then we can build on that one promise because to speak to your point, it's the consistent firing of new thoughts, of new feelings or physiology in my body and of new then behavioral reactions that will create new habits in our mind body system. Yeah. And I love, I love, I mean, the whole Wim Hof method is, is great. But to me, when I think about the Wim Hof method, and he's obviously brilliant, he's done a lot of great research and, and, and uh, advocacy, but it's a very intense yeah. protocol, right? Yes. Is, I mean, do you have to go into the whole thing like to, to, to bring yourself into the moment to calm yourself down? Or is there like a, a more simplified? There's, I mean, you can pretty much simplify any type of breathing technique. Um, I do think it is, it can be intense. It can be a lot of time. It can make you dizzy, that one in particular. Any sort of stimulating vigorous breathing, um, because when our nervous system is shut down, we want to stimulate it. When we're too stimulated and we're feeling anxiety, we're feeling panic, we're in fight or flight, we actually want to calm it by slow, deep belly breathing. Mm. So there's many different ways. We can also stimulate our body through movement. Maybe it's not breathing for some listeners. Maybe it's a couple jumping jacks or, you know, kind of shaking my body out. That stimulation can activate just like breathing can. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I work out, I feel very present. And that's one of the, I think, more meditative aspects yes. of exercise for me. Yes. Um, and then there are even like more uh, sort of... Uh, intense exercise modalities like, you know, martial arts, for example, like boxing or jujitsu. I don't do jujitsu, but I did, I have taken boxing lessons for the past year. And I think one of the most powerful things about it is that you are absolutely drawn into the present because if you're not hyper-focused on the, <laughs> on the moment, you're going to get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> and the same I hear about jujitsu is that, that that's one of the more addictive aspects of that practice. Yeah. For me, I really struggled um, to be still uh, to sit in meditation, to do any of those more traditional ideas of consciousness building. So in the beginning, I used nothing as rigorous as boxing, <laughs> but I used movement. I used, you know, doing a gentle stretching or yoga practice and being mindful because it felt more approachable to tune my attention in like you're describing to my body than just to sit in that stillness or that silence. For me, my mind was racing. I felt so uncomfortable sitting there, so agitated that I think movement can be the most only thing I want to say about movement, if we're 
over kind of stepping our body's limits, I think sometimes exercise, we can kind of err on, we think we're doing, you know, a healthy activity because it's exercise, I'm moving my body. But I think being conscious in my body means hitting stop when my body reaches a limit, knowing what my body's limits are, I should say first, and then resting my body or not pushing it past its limits. And I know some people use exercise actually as like, a way to keep oneself distracted, mm. right? Pushing myself beyond my limits. I'm not even tuned into my body like you sound to be when you're engaging in movement. I'm just tuned into the miles and the maybe the time. And I would argue that that's not necessarily conscious then movement. That's, you know, kind of using movement as a way possibly to distract ourselves from something deeper. Yeah. I think a lot of people use exercise to punish themselves for yeah. things that they've eaten that as well, which is right. a big, big issue. That too. Yes. Do you see a lot of orthorexia? I think, you know, again, it's interesting because on the one hand, we think that these healthy movements and now all this information that's ever available to us can be, you know, nothing but adaptive. I think anything is depending on how we're utilizing it. Yeah. I view most things in this world, even the internet that I know can be seen in many different ways as a tool. You know, am I having a conscious relationship with even something as health foods or health practices? Or again, am I using that to self-punish, to self-harm, or to just keep me endlessly distracted? Yeah, it's a, I, I think like people need to realize that too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. Yes. There's like a U-shaped curve in in almost every aspect of life, especially biology, where there's like a Goldilocks sweet mm -hmm. spot for engaging or ingesting or exposing oneself to a different to a various compound or or what have you. Right. You know, where like a, like some is better than none, but too much isn't exactly great right. either. And I think we can get the guidance where I'm always kind of urging us to look from our own bodies, right? Learning how it feels to push our body a little past its limit versus learning all of the moments where we're maybe pushing our body too much past its limit because there's actually is value in pushing our body into discomfort, not only physical, but emotional. As far as I see it, that's how we develop stress resilience, the ability to tolerate either physically or emotionally stressful experiences or environments and to then bring our or allow our body to return to safety. But that's an individual experience for all of us. My body and its limits are going to be different than your body and its limits. So to speak to your point, if we attune to our body, then we can figure out where our limits are and learn how to then gently step them, overstep them so we can develop that resilience without blowing past them and then creating, like you're saying, a whole handful of issues. Yeah. So unwinding trauma awareness is, is, is the first, the first step. And then from there, where do we go? I mean, like, I, ju I just get the sense that like, or I, the, my, my instinct is that some of these traumas are so, because, you know, you're, you experience them, you experience them when your brain is, is still yes. coming online, right? That they're so deep seated and, and to some degree hardwired. I know that's like a, uh, a hard pill can be a hard pill to swallow, but is that, is that a misconception or is there, you know, do we find, is it, is it coping mechanisms that we find? Um, like how do we really get to the root cause? Yeah, trauma is, and, and I will cite um, trauma as beginning, even possibly for some of us in utero, mm. right? So we're talking about the entire environment in which we were developing, like you're saying, developing fetuses, our nervous system is actually developing, it's actually developing into our 20s even. So beyond now when we're birthed and we're, you know, on this physical plane and all of the experiences that we're having. So section two of the book, once we discover that we have a body and we learn how to, to regulate it and we learn how to regulate our nervous system, now we go into our, our mental and our emotional world. Mm. And that's the area, I think, to speak to your question and trauma that is very impacted. These traumatic events, regardless of where they happened, in utero, out of utero, if they were the cataclysmic one event or many different stressors, they often impact our beliefs about ourselves. They impact how we show up in relation, not only to ourselves and what we think about and feel about ourselves as an individual, but how we relate to others. And this is one of the main areas, especially in relationship, that trauma presents itself when either, A, I don't feel good about myself and I engage in patterns of self-betrayal or self-sabotage, or I have self-limiting beliefs where I keep myself constrained to only a certain possibility of outcomes or how we show up in presentation in relation to another. And a lot of us feel disconnected in our relationships, have a lot of conflict in our relationships. And again, all of that dates back to these early environments, these early overwhelming habit patterns that created adaptations in ourselves. Hmm. How much should we share with our partners? 
Like, I feel like that's a, you know, cause I, I, I feel like I, I strive in my relationships to be as vulnerable as possible and transparent as possible about my challenges. And, uh, you know, and so part of that, I think to me, for me has been sharing with people, friends, but also people that I end up on dates with that, you know, like sort of where w- the, the, the struggles that I have in, in, for example, romantic relationships and the like. So yeah. How much should people be sharing with, with others? It's an interesting question. <laughs> um, cause you know, on the one hand, my, my instinctual answer is whatever the person is comfortable with, yeah. you know, whatever you're, however, speaking to actually a continued version of myself who for a very long time felt like I was sharing all of my emotions with within my relationships and couldn't imagine why every partner I picked up until the current partner that I'm with couldn't understand me emotionally. And I didn't feel emotionally connected to them because I had a perception of myself as this being who was bringing myself or at least my emotional self into my relationships. Because if we want to feel emotionally connected, we have to be, as you're describing yourself, to be vulnerable and put ourselves emotionally out there only to lo and behold, discover in my late twenties that I actually didn't share much of myself at all, unless I talked about the stress that I was having, because that was very much a comfortable, familiar pattern I learned in my childhood, even a pattern of relating. I had a family who was constantly overwhelmed and stressed out and talked about their stress. And even one could say, connect it to each other around stress. So when I got conscious and honest, what I saw was that same patterning in me. I wasn't bringing bringing an emotional depth myself to these relationships, yet I was pointing the finger at everyone else. So on the one hand, I would you know I would say, oh, whatever you're comfortable with. But if you would have asked me a decade ago, you know, I I was comfortably sharing everything about me, and in reality, I I really wasn't sharing much. And now, as I'm challenging myself to be vulnerable, I will speak to the point of how uncomfortable <laughs> it is. So <laughs> if it were up to my comfort level, I still wouldn't be sharing my emotional self with my current partner. So then it's learning, right? Kind of where you are um, and understanding if you are someone who is withholding, if you don't feel emotionally connected, you might have to challenge yourself to share a bit more vulnerably with the people around you. So like sharing the, sharing the parts that are not as (laughs) curated and Instagram perfect with your partner, sharing the parts that are real and true and honest. Yeah. I love that. Relationships are so hard especially these days. Yes. I mean, you have two individuals that are carrying with them probably generations even of these habits and patterns and, you know, the traumas and the reactivity that are coming with it and trying to navigate and create a life together. So (laughs) it is incredibly a, a, a process of sorts of how to navigate relating to others. And interestingly, it's a process we need as humans. We're wired to connect. We need to relate. We need the support of other individuals. So a lot of us feel ourselves kind of pulled in, in two separate you know, ways internally, having this deep need to be connected and then all of the complexity with navigating how to actually connect. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like LA is a magnet for people who are particularly, not to make this, con- you know, to, to steer it in the direction of like being LA centric, but LA just happens to be like, I think one of the worst places to date because it's, people tend to be pretty high on the, on the, on the, uh, narcissistic spectrum and um and and la you know everybody wants to have the sort of like instagram perfect life yeah Uh, that's definitely a problem i think that that exists in la but i think it's probably increasingly elsewhere as well yeah and i think something i do see kind of pretty globally generally and it's really notable is people whether or not in a romantic context or just developing a new relationship with someone or a new connection I see more often than not, the focus is on how I'm being experienced by the other person. Mm. Do they like me? Are they going to call me again? Do they want to date me? Do they want to be my friend? Without really first asking, well, how did I experience this event, this person, this, you know, this interaction? And I think that's a, a different version of whether or not you're someone who's worried about the grand appearance of the Instagram pictures or I think it translates just into that moment of me focused more max on how you're experiencing me than me dropping in and deciding, well, how do I even like you? Or are you yeah. someone that's of interest to me? Yeah. There's that famous line from, uh, what was it, Jerry Maguire or something? You complete me. I think a lot of people still these days are looking for um, to, to be completed by a significant other. Yes. Would you say that that's a, a smart strategy? 
No, absolutely <laughs> not. I think that, and and I think a lot of messaging that many of us grew up exposed to in in our cultures, in our communities, and and in media, um, do give that type of messaging that there, you know, is this completion, this reliance, this kind of one other person, and you know, I, I like to challenge all of that. I think you know, relationships are about two whole, separate, different individuals that I often, you know, kind of refer to the puzzle piece that fit together and create a more whole experience. And if you're looking with this idea of completion, then indirectly you're acknowledging that there is some need that you can't or some part of you that's absent without this other person. And you're really going to create a, a state or a cycle of dependency trying to fill that hole without understanding that or how to become whole on your own. Yeah. Would it, is it is it smarter than to focus on making yourself whole first? Yeah, making sure that you are, you know, kind of balanced, regulated, that you understand your emotions, that you're not reactive, that you're responsive to them, dropping in and exploring for yourself what your values are for talking about relationships, knowing who you are, knowing how to get your needs met and or ask for support in getting your needs met then to interact with someone else and then to add someone else to the equation, expanding it as opposed to relying on this other person. Definitely. And I think one of the least attractive qualities in a person is appearing thirsty. And I feel like that's a quality that is only really exhibited by somebody who has not, uh, has not completed, has not completed themselves yes. yet. Not that that's not that that, you know, I feel like we're all continually on this journey to, to find, to attain quote unquote completion. But yeah, you definitely, I think, um, I mean, that's just the, 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 the impression that I get is that once you start focusing really on making sure that you are at your most sort of complete and whole, that's when you start to manifest. Yeah. I think another kind of thing that arises quite often is forcing change. Mm. And I can speak as probably for many of us as adults, that's, that's, you know, a really, no one wants to be forced to change. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, again, when we have this idea of completion, there is that either direct or indirect pressure that we feel being put on us by possibly our partners to be or show up or act in some different way. And again, I think quite universally, no one really likes to feel controlled or pressured in that way, though it's very common if you are having that framework that you're the problem. So if you change, it's really natural then to point the finger, give the directives, whether it's in passive aggressive communications or in direct ultimatums about how you have to change or I'm leaving. And I think regardless of even if the person very well intentionally wants to hear you being urged or directed, I do think it puts our defenses up and it makes us more likely to be like, screw you. I don't <laughs> actually want to change. Yeah. So how do we have these conversations then? Like what's the best way to, to, to broach these kinds of topics? I mean, having a conversation mm. and I'm actually pausing on that because so many of us, and I'll speak for myself, we imagine the world around us as a mind reader. We don't actually say directly or assertively the things that we want or thinking or that we need. Um, I see many moments now where I just, you know, assume that my partner should know when I need support. How can't you know when I need support? Don't you know me enough, you know, now? And the reality of it is there might be many factors in addition to how I'm showing my need for support, which I've discovered in myself, I don't actually show I need support. Hmm. When I need support, I push people away. Wow. So now not only am I, you know, thinking that they're supposed to just know, I'm actually sending them the completely opposite message. So communication, as simple as that might sound, is so incredibly important because for a lot of us, that brings up the vulnerability of expressing ourselves, our thought, our want, our desire to someone else. And yeah. Then, of course, there's ways we can communicate that might make it more likely for that other person to hear. And one of the biggest shifts we can make is when I'm speaking to you about a change I want to make, avoiding using accusatory you or shaming type language and focusing on me, the impact, how I'm going to show up differently to make sure that this habit changes. Because the second, again, we hear you and we hear blame and we might maybe hear always or never wrapped up in there. You know, we don't actually want to listen. We're mm. not interested in being on your team. I always kind of, I did a lot of work with couples when I was doing individual work. And I would talk about couples learning how to sit next to each other on the couch, say, and have the problem out in front of the couple and take a collaborative approach. The problem isn't one or the other, like we like hot potato. We like to say, <laughs> it's you. No, it's you. How can we collaborate and see the problem as separate from us that we're both contributing to it? and have a conversation about how we needed to change. That's brilliant. 
when uh when you mentioned that in in the heat of the moment with conflict you you kind of dissociate was that is that the term or you retract me personally yeah yes because i find that i do that too like when 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 difficult things come up my inclination is to pull back and to get quiet to flee yeah and to not text the person for three days. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've learned that from my mom who taught me who wh- the way she dealt with anger was icing, the silent treatment. And um, there was periods of time, many of which I probably can't even remember because I have very limited memory of my childhood, though where she wouldn't speak when she was angry. Um, and I have little remnants of that in myself. Similarly, I'm not going to text you. I'm going to go out. Oh, my phone's off today, you know, partner. Now you'll worry about where I'm at and if I'm coming home. Um, that's a way of distancing ourselves from the deeper emotion that's coming up. Yeah. And so, again, just going back to like b- becoming aware of that being Becoming your... aware of the tendency, right? So when we're in a conflict, we're feeling threatened in some way, whether yeah. it's our thought is feeling threatened, our feeling, you know, our need is not being met in that moment. So there's a threat response. So getting really clear with what your typical go-to pattern is. Do you become defensive and scream and yell and bulldoze them in a fight type mode? Do you flee like you and I do, where we leave the room, we ignore, we don't necessarily talk? Do you shut down completely and go come somewhere else entirely in that kind of shutdown space? So the more conscious you become, the more you can navigate your body in that moment. So then you can show up and be more responsive, which for a lot of people might mean taking space from that moment, learning how to call a timeout and how to communicate that directly. Because we only keep ratcheting up the stress level as the conflict continues. And there is a point of no return. There is a point where, you know what, I'm so locked and loaded on this habitual pattern that I'm going to start screaming and yelling soon. So it's making the commitment and possibly having the conversation then with a partner, a friend, a colleague, whoever it is that is a trusted participant in that, that, you know what, the next time that I start to feel out of control or, you know, my nervous system becomes dysregulated, I start to feel like I want to scream and yell at you, I'm going to ask to take space away. The important pivotal thing is what are you doing when you've taken that time out? Because it's going to be a different experience if you say, I need a time out and I'm going to go sit outside or take a walk around the block. If that whole time you're sitting outside and taking a walk around the block, you're rehashing the problem, the issue, and continuing to keep yourself stressed out, chances are by the time you get back from that walk or you come inside, you're only going to have a stronger case (laughs) right, about why you're right. So when you're taking that space, it's actually to calm yourself down. So by sitting, by walking on the block, really not focusing your attention on the court case of how you're going to defend yourself when you get back, but actually trying to calm your body down. And then the next important follow-up piece would be to re-engage a conversation, assuming then that your partner or whoever it is, is also in a calmer space, going into a repair where you can explore what happened, how we both felt how we're going to navigate that differently or what needs to change in that moment because it's the we can't stop conflict. Conflict is always going to be part of us relating to another human because we're two different entities trying to navigate and negotiate life. And mm. I think sometimes we think or we hope that we can find a space in our relationships where we're going to be conflict free forever and that's actually probably not going to happen, <sighs> but what's most pivotal is Do you have those moments of repair? Can you come together afterward? Can you feel reconnected again? It might not be immediately. It might be hours, days, even weeks, depending on how deep the the wounding was. But that is more kind of pivotal to what this health of the relationship than avoiding conflict altogether. Yeah. How do we, is there a way to break our addiction to being right? Cause that's the, that's the thing. Like, I mean, I haven't been in a relationship in a while, but I just remember the value that I placed on coming out of a conflict, right? The victor. And that never went well. Always shot myself in the foot. Well, I could, you know, ask what right <laughs> means. Yeah. I'm assuming, you know, right means some version of your perspective. Yeah. Your yeah. experience. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and a lot of times, you know, we, we are seeking, because again, a conflict will feel a threat. So when we're, our ego is involved, when some sense of who we think we are is being, you know, implicated or challenged in this moment by maybe the perspective that our partner is giving us about who they're perceiving us or experiencing us to be, it's really easy to snap into that defense because we actually feel like part of us and ourself is being threatened and challenged. It's the ego. It's the ego. Ego is not your amigo. Ego is your protector, though. I think ego often gets a bad rap. 
these creations, these narrations about ourselves, came from our very real lived experience, past things that happened, meanings that we've assigned, and then we have repeated over time. And for most of us, they've become our adaptive safe zone. If I've known myself to be, I'm in that zone of familiar, I can feel safer. So again, while it does get a bad rap, it is not our amigo. It actually, in a lot of ways, has been. Hmm. It can continue to create challenges, though, if we can't acknowledge or witness when it's activated and when it's driving our reaction. So in the moment of needing to be right, your ego might still compel you to want to be right in any given moment. Though if you are conscious in that moment, you could make a choice instead of arguing that you're right, falling back and just hearing someone else's perspective. Because again, I think some of us, when we think about ego, we have this idea that we need to get to this place that's non-existent where my ego never acts up, where I never feel compelled to be right. You might continue to want to be right, but you can learn to make a choice to allow someone else's perspective mm. to at least be part of your forward journey. Yeah, I love this. I love that that you're not so black and white about this either, because, you know, it's like Tibetan monks, not that I know all that much about Tibetan Buddhism, but might say that you got to, to, to find happiness, you really have to transcend the ego completely. Whereas I think um, to be a functioning member of society mm -hmm. and somebody who who appears balanced and and whole and connected and with it, so to speak, that there is sort of like that that middle area where you have you can you have you have a relationship with the ego, but you don't let it rule you. Right. Because for a long time, I want to apply this too to just beliefs I used to have myself. I used to have this idea that if I th thought a bad thing, a mean thing, I that somehow made me a bad person. I think a lot of times we merge so much with our thinking mind that we do think having an ego, being defensive around wanting to be right, thinking mean thoughts, or really anything that goes through our mental world does kind of signify or mean something about who we are. Our mental world is just a conditioned space that has been, our neurons have been fired so frequently over time and our mind always seeks to make meaning. It's how we understand and navigate the world around us. And for some of us, we've repeated thoughts and mean thoughts can and might happen. And maybe some of us spend a lot of time with darker thoughts, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that is who we are. No, definitely not. So the the book that you just wrote that's coming out, it's a workbook. And what does it promise for, for readers? Yeah, it's a workbook. It's called How to Meet Yourself with the ultimate goal being a workbook of self-discovery, of discovering your authentic self. So it will provide, a, a, I hope, a livable roadmap for people to begin to journey, first with, again, reconnecting with their body, because in my opinion, it is so foundational. If we're completely dysregulated, we're not going to be able to really navigate our emotions in a way that will continue to allow us to be centered and connected to the world around us. And then ultimately, once we peel back the onion of, our mental world, our emotions, learn how to develop that emotional resilience. Now we can learn how to reconnect with who we really are, what we really want, what's our flow zone, what is our purpose, our passion, and how do we find that space inside of us? I always kind of point to my body, because again, I think this is another area where we think that who we really are, this authentic self, essence, intuition, however it is that you want to define it, we look to our thinking mind. We think it's going to be some instruction in our thought and I'm of the belief that it speaks to us through sensations in our body, through our heart in particular. So really pulling back all the layers of the onion, regardless of where you are on your journey, and giving you the tools to begin that march toward figuring out or learning how to reconnect with that internal guidance. Mm. And so I'm assuming physical exercise, quality sleep, healthy diet, mm -hmm. those all play a role. In, so in, in sort of the foundation? Foundation in terms of those are, in my opinion, your body's basic needs for nervous system health and wellness. Mm. So, and for me on my own journey, after I discovered how disconnected I was, those daily consistent habits have been foundational. Learning how to be consciously attentive to the food that I was eating, learning how to eat, you know, or to make choices around eating whole foods, making sure that I was getting the vitamins that my nervous system needed sleep. Um, as long as I can remember, I struggled to fall asleep at night, to stay asleep at night. So committing to relaxation before bed, allowing myself to get in bed at a time where I can sleep the amount of hours that I need to sleep, um, movement as well. 
being constricted with my muscles, really avoiding physical discomfort. Like I shared with you, I, I like to stay away from things that are uncomfortable. I didn't like to stretch myself. That then applied to my body. I didn't move my body. I didn't stretch my body. Mm. The amount my muscles needed and what that unfortunately just did was continue to sign, send signals of stress to my mind because tense, constricted muscles are signals that your nervous system is activated, that you're in fight or flight. So for me, those habits that you just named were life changing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people, especially those that are averse to exercise, uh, think of exercise as being a really stressful event, but yes. there's nothing as stressful to the body as a lifetime of sedentary yes. behavior. Yes. I mean, that is a major stress. Yes. yes. The kind of stress that'll kill you earlier. Yeah. And because I was that person, I, I played softball up through college. And the second I got off that softball field and, you know, hung my cleats up, I, you didn't see me in a gym. I don't like rigorous, demanding workouts. So I really took the approach of daily natural movements, walking, gentle stretching, you know, building dynamic movements. And it, it can not only be not stressful, but it is the movements that our, our body needs. I, I go back to evolution really often in like the first humans and what they did, right? We walked for long distances. We sprinted a bit. We carried things. So for all of us that don't feel like rigorous workout is, you know, approachable, it's building in those more gentle, natural human movements. And to speak to your point, they're, they're naturally human and they're needed. Yeah. And I mean, exercise is like, it's, it's really like more than anything, I think, I think a supplement, because as you mentioned, it's just our modern lifestyles have become so yes. aberrant when compared to our ancestral yes. lifestyles of like hiking and walking and foraging and carrying and yes. And I noticed it in myself too. I was just on vacation um, for a week and I made the choice while on vacation to to not do my daily movements outside of walking to and from the beach. I sat a lot and by day five of the vacation, I started to feel, for me, I feel an agitation mm. in my mood. I might start to get short with my partners or the people around me. Um, I actually feel like a pent up energy that I need to, to get out. And then I recommit to my movement when I get home and I begin to immediately feel that release and also see it translate. My mood just feels calmer. I'm better able to navigate conflict or stress. Yeah. The mind is like the, is really the biggest obstacle, yes. I think, uh, sometimes when it comes to exercise. Like, I'll just give you an example. I, there was a, a period last week where it was like four days because I was really busy. I, I wasn't able to exercise either. And um, it was just four days, but getting but breaking that inertia, just four, four days is all it <laughs> takes. It felt infinitely more difficult to get to the gym on the fifth day yeah. than it normally does for me. Because it's like, it's a routine. You know, once it's, once it's part of your routine, it's easy. But then once you fall off, it just becomes a lot more difficult to pick it back up again. Yeah. Inertia, it's a bitch. It is. And I even notice moments too, if I'm doing something that is uncomfortable, I'll repeat how uncomfortable it is. I'll like count the amount of seconds or the reps and I'll hyper focus on getting done, <laughs> right? With the discomfort, with this idea that I just need to move past how uncomfortable this is. And that's another, I think, way that we get too focused in our mind. Because if I pay too much attention to how uncomfortable it is, I might stop after this set and not actually yeah. continue. So when I catch myself personally in those moments of, you know, counting or wishing it to be done or like staring at the clock until <laughs> it's done, I refocus my attention on my my physical body or my breathing or the actual feeling of the muscle that I'm working as opposed to my mind narrating how terrible this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I think it's also helpful to have like little perhaps pithy sayings that you could use in the moment when you are feeling miserable to remind yourself, um, why you're there. For example, one thing that, that one saying that really helps for me is even a shitty workout is better than no workout. Yes. So even if I go to the gym and I'm there for literally a half an hour and I just half ass every move that I do, it's better than not having gone. Yeah. I'm there, I'm getting it done. Yes, I, I love that too, because speaking to the perfectionist in me, and as I know many people are, some of us, if we don't have the right amount of time to complete the workout, or if we're starting and it's not feeling right, we throw in the towel, or we degrade and shame ourselves, or don't even bother showing up. So I, I very much take your approach of showing up, you know, and on some days it is half the effort. I only have half the energy or you know, I'm just kind of doing it, but I showed up. Yeah. What are your favorite, uh, to like mo exercise modalities? I like yoga, um, yeah, because yeah, I have that. so much tension and so my upper back and my neck from even my posture, from my stress, my kind of constriction, my protection of my heart space, mm. my posture over time and I'm working to now stretch it. So yoga or some type of stretching is in my daily 
Um, and I like, I too, I got boxing. I have a little boxing and I just got a Peloton. So I've been doing biking and boxing. Um, I don't like cardio. So that's my, the bike is my newest yeah. <laughs> intro into a way to like be on a screen, riding a bike and get <laughs> my cardio in. Cause, and I share my story a lot because I am that person who doesn't love to do this. I think a lot of times because I do it. Yeah. It we people have the idea that it comes naturally or easy or you know it's like not a problem for me and there's many moments where I don't want to do this. So I've created a habit and I've become my own proof in so many ways. Um my partner always says that line and I just love it because on vacation was a prime example. I dropped into my body and I I felt agitated. Mm. I didn't feel good. I now have enough proof of how I feel when I consistently work out. So while there was inertia making that commitment or recommitment when I returned from vacation, I had that memory of how much better I feel when I'm moving. So I was not relying on you to tell me or the book to tell me that I needed to work out. I relied on my own experience of I feel better. Same thing goes with nutrition. I make conscious choices when I eat, which sometimes means I eat food that maybe doesn't make me feel great. I still love my sugar and every now and again I eat gluten. Two things I typically try to limit <laughs> because it impacts my mood, mm. right? I do so consciously, but I also do make the choice to do the things sometimes that I know will have an impact. It's informed consent yeah, exactly. when you do choose to have the gluten or the sugar. Right. Because You're not just eating it mindlessly exactly. like so many people do. And that's, in my opinion, the most empowering shift because just as easily I could have not made that choice or I could stop making that choice as I'm engaging with, say, the eating and I'm not feeling good in that moment. I could just as easily say, you know what? I'm done with this now. Yeah. Do you do you talk about diet much in the in the new book or even in, in previous books? Uh, in How to Do the Work, there is a mind body chapter where I, I talk a bit about nutrition and the gut in particular and how important the gut is. Um, in the first section, there is a bit on uh, nutrition in the new workbook. Yeah, it's a it's an important topic. Yes. Um, well, this was super fun. I mean, anything else that we that we didn't cover that that you feel like bringing up? I, I feel like my audience is. Uh, I think I definitely think we have like overlap in terms of the people that follow you, the people that follow me. So, um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm loving this so far, but if there's anything else. I think I can think of, I just like to commend, I mean, you for the work you're doing, your audience for, for listening to, to these topics. You know, I think that we have so much information that is accessible to us these days. And I think that for some of us, it, it can feel overwhelming. New ideas can challenge um, again, everything that we've been talking about, who we think we are, what we believe, when we are met with new information, it can really cause us to become defensive, to challenge it, to diminish it. So I'm always in honor of people that are curious, that are interested in hearing new ideas, even if they're challenging and might not be for you or might not be the choice you make into the future, though it is a commendable thing to expose ourselves to new ideas. So I always like to kind of congratulate people who do expand their minds and listen to conversations and you know channels like you have and expose ourselves because there's so much information. I think we can just kind of crawl into a rock and become so overwhelmed or again, become really defensive when we hear new ideas. Oh yeah, I make it a point to bring on people regularly that um, I don't, people who have ideas about health and nutrition that I don't necessarily agree with, at least not, a hundred percent, you know, like people, people that, that are bringing ideas to the table that uh, might challenge me in some way. Yes, I love that. Yeah. That is part of what you do because that's a, a challenging thing and it really is a gift um, to the collective. Super important. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. We have stories that were written on our mental chalkboards when we were five years old about who we are, whether we're creative, what kind of life and love and relationships we deserve. And the way we deal with this inner world of ours drives everything.